Maritime Incident and Accident Investigation. Part 2 of the lecture. Contents, Model Swiss Cheese and Management of Investigation Process. A loss causation model, Swiss Cheese. It was found that Swiss Cheese model can be used to study the casual factors to an accident in an efficient way. In this slightly modified Swiss cheese model a classification has been made between the operational errors and errors during the prevention slash mitigation actions. Operational errors related to all those errors that occur during the normal operations and consequently can lead system to an undesired situation, while prevention slash mitigation errors are the errors which can happen when system is already in an undesired situation. At this point, Actions could be preventive if the system is still in allowable boundaries and mitigation if an accident has already occurred. Moreover, a classification is also maintained among the technical slash human and automatic slash manual interventions corresponding to operational and barrier layers, respectively as detailed in below figure. Relevant latent errors are also highlighted showing the influence on the active errors. Whenever, the layers align in a way to provide a pass to existing hazard and accident can occur. Modified Swiss cheese model. Operator can interact with the automatic safety barrier, for example is both during the normal operating conditions and during the maintenance conditions, for example proof test, which are considered in the human operational layer. Apart from automatic safety barriers, Manual safety barriers are also considered in this model. If consequences of a failure is very local and can be controlled by the human barrier, then it is recommended to use the human barrier. Since initiating the automatic shutdown sequences also involved steps like isolation and depressurization which itself can enhance the complications. This model assumes that potential undesired situations can occur due to technical failure, for example random rupture, and also due to failure of human intervention. Furthermore, if these scenarios have been foreseen during the design phase of the plant or during the safety assessment there must be safety barrier to prevent the situation or at least to mitigate the consequences. An accident, as defined by definition during the design phase, can occur only if the automated safety barrier doesn't intervene when required. In addition to that manual barrier interventions can also be analyzed by looking into supervisions of either human operational interventions or by providing manual prevention slash mitigation measures. In this model organizational and meteorological latent errors slash performance shaping factors are considered for the equipment, while for the operator's actions organizational, environment and stress slash fatigue have been considered. However, to study an accident in detail other models can be used depending upon the depth of an analysis. Possible system paths. After doing a preliminary analysis of accidents, it was concluded that an accident can occur by involving different layers. Table 1 listed the three predominant accidental situations by involving the different layers as the initiating cause of an accident, while model B represents the involvement of one of the barrier layers, either automatic or manual. Model 1 corresponds to situations when failure of technical and human active errors both led to an accident along with the failure of subsequent barrier layers. Model 2 corresponds to the situations when only the failure of technical, that is equipment, layer led to an accident. In this model no active human errors are involved but since technical failures could be influenced by the organizational characteristics therefore this model is considered separately. Model 3 represents the only situations when the active human failure can lead to an accident. In this model there will be no involvements of the technical, i.e. equipment, errors. Human factor is a safety layer. Operator has to perform normally 4Ds when it is required to use them as safety barrier. 4Ds are detect, diagnose, decide and do an action. Therefore, whenever using an operator as safety barrier it should be required to analyze 4Ds accordingly to ensure the maximum reliability of the operator. 
case study a past accident. In order to implement the revised Swiss cheese model to accidents, an accident happened in 2015 at one of BP's offshore oil rigs. Unclear markings caused confusion leading to operator error are the main causes to this accident. A temporary employee closed the valve under supervision of his mentor. After a while the temporary employee returned without his mentor. Since he had doubts if the valve was really closed he turned it a second time. At that time he thought he closed it, but in fact with this action he opened valve again activating the alarm. He then decided to turn the valve a third time. Now the valve was closed. He didn't know that there is always a minor delay in the decrease of pressure in the pipeline since it was long pipeline because of which the alarm bells continue to go off for a short time. Operator then asked for assistance of the mentor. They decided to turn the valve fourth time thinking it would close the valve but actually opened it again. And most importantly they turned off the alarms. Higher pressure in the pipeline leading to release of 50 tons of butane to atmosphere. Unclear markings, open slash close, on the valve caused the confusion for operator to carry out the right action. These marking were applied as improvement slash correction action followed a similar accident two years prior to this accident. But, in fact these improvement caused more confusion. Since this accident causes by the operator error explicitly without any technical, that is equipment failure, so it corresponds to the Model 3 as illustrated above. Casual model of this accident is represented in the Model 5 below. This model can help to identify the relevant latent errors corresponds to a layer or even to understand the relevant safety barriers. This retrospective approach to learning from accidents can also be applied in proactive way to understand the operator equipment interactions and also function of safety barriers. Principles of investigation, as prescribed by MO code. Independence, a marine safety investigation should be unbiased to ensure the free flow of information to it. In order to achieve the outcome, the investigator, S. Carrying out a marine safety investigation should have functional independence from the parties involved in the marine casualty or marine incident, anyone who may make a decision to take administrative or disciplinary action against an individual or organization involved in a marine casualty or marine incident, and judicial proceedings. The investigator, S. Carrying out a marine safety investigation should be free of interference from the parties in the above paragraph with respect to the gathering of all available information relevant to the marine casualty or marine incident, including voyage data recordings and vessel traffic services recordings, analysis of evidence and the determination of causal factors, drawing conclusions relevant to the causal factors, distributing a draft report for comment and preparation of the final report, and, if appropriate, the making of safety recommendations. Safety focused, it is not the objective of a marine safety investigation to determine liability or apportion blame. However, the investigator, S., carrying out a marine safety investigation should not refrain from fully reporting on the causal factors because fault or liability may be inferred from the findings. Cooperation, where it is practicable and consistent with the requirements and recommendations of this code, in particular Chapter 10 on cooperation, the Marine Safety Investigating State, S, should seek to facilitate maximum cooperation between substantially interested states and other persons or organizations conducting an investigation into a marine casualty or marine incident. Priority, a marine safety investigation should, as far as possible, be afforded the same priority as any other investigation including investigations by a state for criminal purposes being conducted into the marine casualty or marine incident. The investigator, S, 
carrying out a marine safety investigation should not be prevented from having access to evidence in circumstances where another person or organization is carrying out a separate investigation into a marine casualty or marine incident. The evidence for which ready access should be provided should include survey and other records held by the flag state, the owners, and classification societies, all recorded data, including voyage data recorders, and evidence that may be provided by government surveyors, coast guard officers, vessel traffic service operators, pilots or other marine personnel. Scope of a marine safety investigation, proper identification of causal factors requires timely and methodical investigation, going far beyond the immediate evidence and looking for underlying conditions which may be remote from the site of the marine casualty or marine incident and which may cause other future marine casualties and marine incidents. Marine safety investigations should therefore be seen as a means of identifying not only immediate causal factors but also failures that may be present in the whole chain of responsibility. Management of Investigation Process Immediate Response to Major Marine Casualty Alert Initial actions. Notification of an accident may come in to the investigator in a variety of ways, possibly in a message from the owners, possibly one from the ship, possibly in press and media reports, possibly by notification from a port state or an RCC. However, the notification arrives and assuming the event is one which warrants investigation there are a number of immediate actions that are needed. Not all of them will be needed in all cases but the following list is a good guide assuming a fairly major incident at the flag state. 1. Designate an investigator or an investigating team depending on the seriousness of the event and dispatch them to the scene. 2. Contact donors, managers, classification society and port state officers to inform them that investigators are en route and elicit their cooperation. If possible provide them with the names of the investigator, S, and their travel arrangements. 3. Contact emergency response agencies who may be involved at the scene and inform them that an investigation is being undertaken and seek their cooperation and assistance in preserving evidence at the scene. 4. Contact any other interested states who might be involved with a view to a cooperative investigation. 5. If the incident is a major one, prepare an initial press release and nominate someone with experience to deal with media queries. Investigation Procedure Outline Once an investigation commences, the site is managed even before investigators arrive at the scene. Make arrangements for the preservation of the accident scene and for the control of access if possible, particularly if the accident involves property belonging to a third party. Meet with representatives of any interested states, if applicable. A start-up meeting is convened if more than one state is involved in the safety investigation. If there exist other substantially interested states, the representatives could be part of the meeting. This meeting facilitates knowledge sharing among the investigators, the investigation plan development and task delegation among other things. Make an early overview of the ship slash scene and get a broad picture of events from which a basic plan of approach can be drawn up. Often a ship's master will already have drawn up a report to owners which can be used to get an overview of the events. The next step normally is collection of evidence where the investigator's aim is to gather all factual data and evidence that may be of interest to the investigation scope before the scene is disturbed. This could include witness statements, documentary and physical evidence etc. At this juncture, the casualty site could be inspected for further documentation of the site, the ship, other ships involved, fairway where the accident occurred, and conduct underwater survey as well as take videos of the ship's wreckage. Following this, the voyage data recorder and other onboard electronic devices could be taken as physical evidence. Other physical evidence could include logbooks, onboard weather forecasts, nautical charts, 
fire alarm units, electronic charting units, oil samples, fire and paint residues and broken parts or machinery pieces. Make arrangements for access to local witnesses, pilots, VTS operators, members of the public, stevedores etc. if this is appropriate and set up appointments for interviews. Arrange interpretation facilities if necessary. Obtain copies of any videotapes, radio recordings, radar recordings and similar evidence. If officials such as pilots refuse to cooperate, seek the cooperation of the port state and their jurisdiction to compel cooperation if possible. A skilled person in interviewing techniques should conduct witness interviews for revelation of information by the interviewee. The location and time in addition to requirement of an interpreter and particular needs of the interviewee among others must be considered. After the interview, the documents, records and procedures have to be reviewed and this can consist of ship related and personal certificates, ship's classification society's report, master's standing orders and maintenance records etc. An assessment of the ship's safety management system from its policy and its implementation should be considered. When relevant, specialized studies can be conducted for establishment of how an incident or casualty occurred. Broken parts of machines metallurgic specialist studies, ship stability reconstruction features, oil and paint analysis, weather and sea condition analysis at the place and time of the incident or casualty, lashing calculation and the usage of simulator for reconstruction and analysis of a sequence of events could all be considered. Make arrangements for a base ashore. Ideally this will be somewhere like the investigator's hotel where a small room should be set aside on, neutral ground where the investigators can interview witnesses and hold their own discussions and briefings. Telephone and fax facilities, and possibly photocopying, computer and data access facilities, will be needed in most serious cases. In a major casualty, there will need to be a command center ashore where the investigation team have facilities for interviewing numerous witnesses, collating large amounts of evidence, possibly storing physical evidence and conducting their own briefing meetings. A large dedicated conference style room is ideal with separate private rooms available for interviews. The center will need photocopying and communications facilities for fax, phone and data, preferably on dedicated lines. An important function for the command center will be media management and there should be facilities for press briefings and interviews. For support of analysis and reconstruction in safety investigation, several methods of organizing evidence exist. However, each of them has its merits and demerits. From a safety perspective, ensuring that a thorough examination of the casualty or incident is made, it is important for the investigation to be conducted from a systemic point of view. This involves not only determining who did what, but also searching for influential factors of different relevant events even in circumstances that these conditions are found remote from the casualty site. Human factors context involving interactions between machine, man and the organization is considered by the systemic perspective. What follows next is reconstructing the casualty events and linking them with their conditions. The initial step here would be to review facts and clarify relevance of the information ensuring that it is as complete as practicable. At this level, the aim of the analysis should be to determine how the marine incident or casualty occurred. Preferably, the reconstruction is carried out with a method that would allow events sequence graphical description. This is important because it would allow the investigator to present and discuss the case and also particular things like identifying information gaps, conflicting evidence, contributing factors and other relevant aspects. The underlying safety issues causing or contributing to the casualty or incident can be well understood with the safety analysis. However, safety analysis and casualty analysis could be combined as one in some methods of investigation analysis. 
Furthermore, a direct linkage of some basic analysis method to events reconstruction could be made while different accident causation models could be used as other safety analysis tools and could be even much better when used as standalone methods. The report has to be made at this stage as MOMSC-MEPC.3-4 requires that the final version of the marine safety investigation together with particular marine casualty data to be entered into the Global Integrated Shipping Information System, GISIS, Marine Casualties and Incidents Module. Finally, there will be consultation for rectification of particular matters on the report and then a follow-up on safety recommendations for positive reinforcement by making the recommendations public. Investigation process in more details. Levels and types of investigation. There are broadly three main levels of investigation depending on the severity of the casualty and its consequences, each requiring a different approach. The most serious events require a major mobilization of resources. There will be a team of several investigators under a lead investigator, supported by media coordinators, technical specialists, laboratory research facilities and a range of others, all in turn supported by the flag administration. The compilation of the final report may well involve an assessment board in some countries and will involve contributions from all those participating. Less serious events will normally require a lower level of response, typically one or two investigators will attend, interview witnesses, collect evidence and then making use of support facilities within the flag state and any necessary research work, compile the final report for the flag state. Minor events, if a field investigation is warranted, will normally require only one investigator on scene who will conduct interviews, collect and examine evidence and then either prepare a brief report for consideration by the flag state or store the basic details for statistical analysis. The majority of reported incidents tend to be of a minor nature and will not require the attendance of investigators on site. It will often be sufficient to call for reports from the ship and examine them to establish the essential facts. Further investigations can be undertaken if the examination suggests a need, but in most cases the incident can be closed on the basis of the reports from the ship. Appointing the investigator. Each flag administration will have its own system of accident investigation, most commonly either a specialized accident investigation unit with a staff of dedicated investigators or a system where individual surveyors, normally engaged in ship survey work are tasked with accident investigation when necessary. Both systems have their individual strengths and are both are equally valid in meeting international convention obligations to investigate casualties. The number of investigators appointed to conduct any investigation depends on the size of the investigation, the need for speed, the impact of the investigation, the location of the accident, and the individual skills and strengths of the investigators. Ideally investigators should be specially trained, at least in the techniques of interviewing witnesses. There are a range of techniques available such as cognitive interview techniques which have the capability to allow an investigator to establish a much greater amount of recall from a witness than can be established by the untrained interviewer. Initial assessment of available evidence. In every case, from a grounding when the investigators reach the ship after she has been refloated, to a file where the ship is alongside and burning when the investigators arrive there will be a need to gather initial evidence as quickly as possible. No matter what the circumstances, the passage of time will dilute the available evidence. Potential witnesses will depart, physical evidence will decay, documentation will be collected by a variety of people, and memories will fade. Perhaps more importantly witnesses and those involved will begin to rationalize their recollections of the events and, without meaning to, will tend to vary their memories and adjust the priorities of remembered facts as they inevitably talk with others. There may be press speculation and media coverage which, in turn, will tend to distort people's recollections. It is critical, 
Therefore, for the investigators to gather an overview as quickly as possible and then plan the scope and direction of the investigation to minimize these effects. In many cases the most useful initial source of information is the ship's senior officers. In many cases they will, immediately after the event, have drafted a report to owners, or at least made log entries. It is in the nature of seafarers to do this and these initial reports are usually written virtually contemporaneously. They will often give a good picture of the overall events, key timings and the personnel involved. In the absence of this sort of information the investigator should seek to establish, as quickly as possible from whatever source, this same basic information. In conjunction with the owner's representatives and agents, if appropriate, the investigators should then set the priorities for evidence collection and witness interviews and make a basic plan which captures the best information possible. In many cases the investigators will not arrive at the ship until a few days after the accident. Obviously it is in the nature of ships that unless she is at total loss, controls and equipment will have been moved or used when recovering from the accident and making the ship safe with the view to returning her to service. The flag state coordinator who has dispatched the investigation team should already have stressed to the personnel on site the importance of preserving evidence as far as possible. In the case of a major casualty there will be a corresponding need for the best possible preservation of evidence. Steps which should be considered, where appropriate, and which can be taken in any investigation include removing and excluding all persons from the accident scene except essential emergency response personnel, cordoning off the area and locking doors and gates, posting warning signs, utilizing security personnel to control access. As important as the initial impression of the event is an initial walkthrough of the accident scene. This may in some cases be the only and best opportunity the investigators have to assess the scene before it is disturbed by others and this opportunity should be taken to photograph the scene as thoroughly as possible. Make contemporaneous notes, sketches and diagrams, especially of evidence which can easily be destroyed, positions of controls and switches, location of used emergency equipment, extent of damage etc. It is often useful to take a small tape recorder and make continuous voice notes for later transcription while walking through the scene. Record exactly what any emergency response personnel are doing. This allows the best chance of working back to the state of the scene before they started their activities. Meetings with interested parties. It is inevitable that in any casualty there will be other interested parties. Indeed the number of these, in the initial stages, will probably be greater in less serious cases than in major events. In major casualties, particularly those with loss of life, the other parties will often tend to differ to the flag state investigator. In less serious cases they will each be seeking to protect their own or their clients' positions. Regardless of the casualty investigation, there will be ensuing litigation and the parties involved will be anxious to protect their positions. It is probable that in many cases the investigator will come across all or some of investigators and surveyors from the salvage association, surveyors from the owner's PNDA club, experts appointed by the PNDA club, lawyers representing PNDA interests surveyors and experts appointed by cargo interests, lawyers representing cargo interests, lawyers representing individual crew members, lawyers representing salvers, lawyers representing owners. All these are in addition to emergency services and port state officials who may be present. In an incident, especially one which is not a major disaster, these representatives will all be seeking to protect their own client's interests. When there has been damage, especially cargo damage, the owner will be very conscious of the fact that in the future, he will be facing litigation in respect of cargo and insurance claims, 
and while these other parties will usually differ to the investigator in major cases, or where there has been loss of life, in other cases they will actively pursue their own cause. The investigator should remember that most of these representatives have a right to be there and many of them may well arrive on scene before the investigator. They can, sometimes unknowingly, cause problems for the investigation. The owner's lawyers, for example, will almost certainly wish to interview the crew and may well have started this process before the investigator arrives. They represent their client's interests and while they will not usually hide evidence they will often, in their questions, have the effect of leaving crew members with a recollection which can be biased towards the owner's view of events. They may also seek to remove certain physical evidence for analysis by their own experts to support their client's case. They will certainly attempt to obtain and hold documentary evidence. It must be remembered that in many cases they will have a perfect legal right to do so. In these circumstances there can be often be a conflict between the investigator and these representatives and for this reason the investigator needs to be very certain of his or her own legal powers as they apply to the situation. The most effective way forward in these situations is for the investigator to hold a briefing meeting with all the interested parties as soon as possible after arriving on scene. The briefing meeting should seek to set out and explain for everyone that the flag state investigation is the prime investigation, but the investigator will cooperate with others as far as possible so long as it does not interfere with the prime investigation. The legal powers held by the investigator making it clear that they will be used if necessary. The procedures for interviews and the legal rights of interviewees, the legal status of their statements and rights of access to them and the rules governing access by third parties to interviews. The procedures for dealing with physical evidence and documentation and the procedures for sharing copies of this with other interested parties. An effective meeting can go a long way to avoiding conflicts and duplication of work. Collection and preservation of evidence. Tools used, questionnaires and personal structured interviews. Obtaining evidence from seafarers. Where a marine safety investigation requires a seafarer to provide evidence to it, the evidence shall be taken at the earliest practical opportunity. The seafarer shall be allowed to return to his or her ship, or be repatriated at the earliest possible opportunity. The seafarer's human rights shall, at all times, be upheld. All seafarers from whom evidence is sought shall be informed of the nature and basis of the marine safety investigation. Further, a seafarer from whom evidence is sought shall be informed, and allowed access to legal advice, regarding, any potential risk that they may incriminate themselves in any proceedings subsequent to the marine safety investigation, any right not to self-incriminate or to remain silent, any protections afforded to the seafarer to prevent the evidence being used against them if they provide the evidence to the marine safety investigation. Collection of further evidence. A marine safety investigating state s sh should not unnecessarily detain a ship for the collection of evidence from it or have original documents or equipment removed unless this is essential for the purposes of the marine safety investigation. Investigators should make copies of documents where practicable. Investigator s Carrying out a marine safety investigation should secure records of interviews and other evidence collected during a marine safety investigation in a manner which prevents access by persons who do not require it for the purpose of the investigation. Investigator S. Carrying out the marine safety investigation should make effective use of all recorded data including voyage data recorders if fitted. Voyage data recorders should be made available for downloading by the investigator, s, carrying out a marine safety investigation or an appointed representative. In the event that the marine safety investigating state do not have adequate facilities to read a voyage data recorder, states with such a capability should offer their services having due regard to the available resources, capabilities of the Red Out facility, timeliness of the red out, and, 
Location of the facility. Preservation of evidence. There are three types of evidence, physical, human, obtained through witness statements or interviews, and documentary, including photographic media. Physical evidence may include solids, liquids, or gases. Documentary evidence includes all documentation developed by the investigator as well as accident-related paperwork and electronic data, such as charts, logbooks, instrument charts, as built drawings, schematics, engineering analysis, vendor information, correspondence, computer software and data printouts. Particularly valuable are contemporaneous notes made by personnel involved such as bridge and engine room notebooks. Physical Evidence Most physical evidence can be left intact at a protected accident scene to await later investigation. Some evidence may be perishable and have to be removed quickly and preserved. For example liquid samples that might require chemical analysis need to be collected quickly and sealed if the subsequent analysis of content is to be useful, likewise fluid samples which might evaporate or be absorbed need to be collected quickly. Some physical evidence may have been removed during the emergency response or casualty evacuation and the investigator should be aware of this and an early question to be directed to emergency response personnel should be in relation to any material of any kind that they might have removed from the scene during their work. For physical evidence to be truly useful its integrity needs to be preserved and the investigator, before moving anything should record the exact location of the evidence at the scene, its orientation, its time of collection and its status using measurements, logs, sketches, photographs or video where appropriate. Collected evidence needs to be stored and to maintain its integrity after collection, the investigator should ensure that it is stored in a secure location, that a chain of custody record is created which documents clearly the chain for each item, that access is controlled where necessary. Note the investigator should be conservative in deciding what items are evidence. It is easy to discard those, not useful, but virtually impossible to return and collect, forgotten, items later. Also examination of organizational concerns, management systems, and line management oversight and chain of command must be conducted. The most obvious physical evidence related to an accident or accident scene often includes solids such as equipment, tools, materials, hardware, pre- and post-accident positions of accident-related elements, scattered debris, patterns, parts and properties of physical items associated with the accident. Less obvious but potentially important physical evidence includes fluids. Documenting physical evidence. Evidence should be carefully documented at the time it is obtained or identified. The accident investigation physical evidence log can help investigators document and track the collection of physical evidence. In a multi-investigator team investigation, the use of an evidence log will prevent several investigators asking for the same piece of evidence, thereby avoiding duplication of effort. Additional means of documenting physical evidence include sketches, maps, photographs, and videotape. Sketching and mapping. Sketching and mapping the position of debris equipment, tools, and injured persons may be initiated by the team as soon as it arrives on scene. Position maps convey a visual representation of the scene immediately after an accident. Evidence may be inadvertently moved, removed, or destroyed, especially if the accident scene could only be partially secured. Therefore, sketching and mapping should be conducted immediately after recording initial witness statements. Precise scale plotting of the position of elements can subsequently be examined to develop and test accident causal theories. Photographing and videotaping physical evidence. Photography is a valuable and versatile tool in accident investigation. Photos or videos can identify, 
record, or preserve physical accident evidence that cannot be effectively conveyed by words or collected by any other means. Photographic coverage should be detailed and complete, including standard references to help establish distance and perspective. Videotapes should cover the overall accident scene, as well as specific locations or items of significance. A thorough videotape allows the team to minimize trips to the accident scene. This may be important if the scene is difficult to access or if it presents hazards. Inspecting physical evidence. Following initial mapping and photographic recording, a systematic inspection of physical evidence can begin. The inspection involves surveying the involved equipment, vehicles, structures, etc., to ascertain whether there is any indication that component parts were missing or out of place before the accident, noting the absence of any parts of guards, controls, or operating indicators, instruments, position indicators, etc., among the damaged or remaining parts of the scene, identifying as soon as possible any equipment or parts that must be cleaned prior to examination or testing and transferring them to a laboratory or to the care of an expert experienced in appropriate testing methodologies, noting the routing or movements of records that can later be traced to find missing components, preparing a checklist of complex equipment components to help ensure a thorough survey, removing physical evidence. Following the initial inspection of the scene, investigators may need to remove items of physical evidence. To ensure the integrity of evidence for later examination, the extraction of parts must be controlled and methodical. The process may involve simply picking up components or pieces of damaged equipment, removing bolts and fittings, cutting through major structures, or even recovering evidence from beneath piles of debris. Before evidence is removed from the accident scene, it should be photographed and its position noted on an appropriate sketch of the scene. Remember, once it has been moved, it will never be able to be returned to exactly the same position that it occupied before it was moved. It should then be carefully packaged and clearly identified. The readiness team or a pre-assembled investigator's kit can provide general-purpose cardboard tags or adhesive labels for this purpose. Equipment or parts thought to be defective, damaged, or improperly assembled should be removed from the accident scene for technical examination. If improper assembly is suspected, investigators should direct that the part or equipment be photographed and otherwise documented as each sub-assembly is removed. Items that have been fractured or otherwise damaged should be packaged carefully to preserve surface detail. Delicate parts should be padded and boxed. Both the part and the outside of the package should be labeled. Greasy or dirty parts can be wrapped in foil and placed in polyethylene bags or other non-absorbent materials for transport to a testing laboratory, command center or evidence storage facility. If uncertainties arise, subject matter experts can advise the board regarding effective methods for preserving and packaging evidence and specimens that must be transported for testing. When preparing to remove physical evidence, these guidelines should be followed. Normally, extraction should not start until witnesses have been interviewed, since visual reference to the accident site can stimulate one's memory. Extraction and removal or movement of parts should not be started until position records, measurements for maps and photographs, have been made. Be aware that the accident site may be unsafe due to dangerous materials or weakened structures. Locations of removed parts can be marked with orange spray paint or wiry staff marking flags. The marking flags can be annotated to identify the part removed and to allow later measurement. Care during extraction and preliminary examination is necessary to avoid defacing or distorting impact marks and fracture surfaces. The lead investigator and team members should concur when the parts extraction work can begin in order to assure that board members have completed all observations requiring an intact accident site. Documentary evidence includes paper and electronic information, such as records, reports, 
procedures, photographs, and documentation. Collecting documentary evidence. Documentary evidence can provide important data and should be preserved and secured as methodically as physical evidence. This information might be in the form of logbooks, equipment readouts, course recorded traces, licenses, documents, certificates, papers, photos, videotape, magnetic tape, or electronic media, either at the site or in files at other locations. Some work slash process slash system records are retained only for the work day or the week. Electronic data is often stored in a memory buffer and is overwritten as new data is acquired. Once an accident has occurred, the investigator must work quickly to collect and preserve these records so they can be examined and considered in the analysis. In some cases it may be necessary to obtain the services of a suitably competent translator. Accident investigation planning should include procedures for identifying records to be collected, as well as the people responsible for their collection. Because records are not always located at the scene of the accident, and some documents may be overlooked in the preliminary collection of evidence. Documents often provide important evidence for identifying causal factors of an accident. This evidence is useful for thoroughly examining the policies, standards, and specifications that molded the environment in which the accident occurred, indicating the attitudes and actions of people involved in the accident, revealing evidence that generally is not established in verbal testimony. Documentary evidence generally can be grouped into four categories. Management control documents that communicate management expectations of how, when, where, and by whom work activities are to be performed. Records that indicate past and present performance and status of the work activities, as well as the people, equipment and materials involved. Reports that identify the content and results of special studies, analyses, audits, appraisals, inspections, inquiries, and investigations related to work activities. Follow-on documentation that describes actions taken in response to the other types of documentation. Collectively, this evidence gives important clues to possible underlying causes of errors, malfunctions, and failures that led to the accident. Analysis of documents may involve two major aspects cross-checking documents from different sources that contain the same information or scientific analysis. Analysis could include cross-checking the bridge movement or bell book with the engine room records. It cannot be emphasized enough that contemporaneous records, those made at the time, are of value, fair copies of log books, for example the scrap log copied out in a fair hand are of limited value. Of greater value is the cross-checking of ship's records with external sources such as VTS tapes, harbor control tapes or log books, cargo terminal records, police records, customs records, or even TV or radio recordings. Investigators must keep an open mind and think literally asking, who else may have similar information? Photocopies. Investigators should be sensitive to the possibility that photocopies of documents may not truly depict the original document. Erasures and or the use of white out correction liquids, which may be apparent on the original document, may not show up on a photocopy of the document. Further, as in the case of logbooks, entire pages may be removed. If the investigator does not examine the original document, he will not know for sure that the photocopy provided him is, in fact, a true and accurate copy. Before photocopies of documents are accepted, the investigator should compare the copy with the original to assure that there have been no alterations to the original. Marine Documents A list of maritime documentation that may be collected or reviewed during a marine accident investigation can be found on Appendix 2 of Chapter 5. The list, while lengthy, is far from complete. The specific documents needed by the investigator will vary depending on the type of accident. International Safety Management System 
accident investigations must thoroughly examine organizational concerns, management systems, and line management oversight processes to determine whether deficiencies in these areas contributed to causes of the accident. The investigation team should consider the full range of management systems through all levels of management in accordance with the International Safety Management ISM, code. It is important to note that this focus should not be directed toward individuals. Human evidence. Human evidence also needs preservation. Human recollection of events, like many types of physical evidence, tends to degrade over time and recollections recorded immediately after the event tend to be more accurate than those collected later. All persons involved in any accident will tend naturally to try and make sense of the event afterwards and shipboard personnel will naturally talk to a cover and speculate on the causes in the aftermath. This leads to an inevitable tendency for witnesses to unconsciously vary the priority and importance of certain facts that they have witnessed to suit the group's overall picture of the event. These distortions are natural and can be filtered out by careful questioning but the best way to avoid them is to collect the human evidence as quickly as possible. This should not preclude the opportunity to interview the same witness again later. It is equally true that many people will remember useful facts surrounding the accident only some time afterwards and it is often the case with key personnel that an initial interview will reveal the main facts while a subsequent interview will bring out further detail which can sometimes be crucial. Human evidence is often the most insightful and also the most fragile. Witness recollection declines rapidly in the first 24 hours following an accident or traumatic event. Therefore, witnesses should be located and interviewed immediately and with high priority. As physical and documentary evidence is gathered and analyzed throughout the investigation, this new information will often prompt follow-up questioning. Note, quickly identify key witnesses and collect their statements because their initial Statements are often more accurate and have greater credibility than those made later, but be prepared to return to the same witnesses some time later when they are often able to add detail in key areas. Other persons such as emergency response personnel, members of the public, persons who arrive at the scene shortly after the incident and anyone else who might be expected to provide material information should be identified located and asked to provide statements. If circumstances prevent the investigation team from taking all the witness statements immediately, the names and contact details of witnesses should be recorded so that they may be contacted later. Note, access to the owner's employees, the ship's crew, is usually a right enjoyed by the owner's lawyers who will certainly make use of it but the same lawyers will not usually have jurisdiction or a right to interview other persons which gives the investigator a major advantage in collecting all the evidence and developing a complete picture of the events. Type of witness relationship to the accident. Principal witnesses, persons directly involved in the event or who suffered injury from it, for example, master, pilots, watch keepers, stevedores, Eyewitnesses participants. Observers who saw the accident or the events immediately preceding, during or following it. Emergency response personnel. Persons arriving at the scene shortly after the accident and involved in actions to save life, property and or the environment. Other potential witnesses. Company shore management personnel. Port officials. Members of the public. Persons engaged in the operation of the ship such as shift workers on duty prior to the accident, repair personnel who worked on the ship slash equipment prior to the accident. Equipment or vessel designers, naval architects, fire experts, other experts. To ensure that the list of potential witnesses is as complete as possible and to identify any who may have left the scene it is useful to ask all witnesses at every interview, to list any others who were in the vicinity or who were seen near the time. It is also useful to ask a witness to make a sketch of the accident setting out the positions of other persons and of events.
such sketches when collated can produce useful confirmation of the sequence of events and can suggest avenues of investigation which may not be clear from statements alone. Note, there are a number of interview techniques commonly used by other investigative bodies, such as, cognitive interviewing, which can be very useful in collecting the maximum amount of evidence from witnesses. Preparing for interviews. Much of the investigation's fact-finding occurs in interviews. Therefore, to elicit the most useful information possible from interviewees, interviewers must be well prepared and have clear objectives, the topical areas, and strategies for each interview. Interview can be individual and group. Each type has advantages and disadvantages. Interviewing best practices. Create a relaxed atmosphere. Introduce yourself and shake hands. Be polite, patient, and friendly. Treat witnesses with respect. Prepare the witness. Describe the investigation's purpose, to prevent accidents, not to assign blame. Explain that witnesses may be interviewed more than once. Stress how important the facts given during interviews are to the overall investigative process. Record information. Rely on a court reporter to provide a detailed record of the interview. Note crucial information immediately in order to ask me a 9 2 full follow-up questions. Ask questions. Establish a line of questioning and stay on track during the interview. Ask the witness to describe the accident in full before asking a structured set of questions. Let witnesses tell things in their own way, start the interview with a statement such as, would you please tell me about this or that. Ask several witnesses similar questions to corroborate facts. Aid the interviewee with reference points, for example, how did the lighting compare to the lighting in this room. Keep an open mind, ask questions that explore what has already been stated by others in addition to probing for missing information. Use visual aids, such as photos, drawings, maps, and graphs to assist witnesses. Be an active listener, and give the witness feedback, restate and repraise key points. Ask open-ended questions that generally require more than a, yes, or, no, answer. Observe and note how replies are conveyed, voice inflections, gestures, expressions, etc. Close the interview. End on a positive note, thank the witness for his or her time and effort. Allow the witnesses to read the interview transcript and comment if they so desire. Encourage the witness to contact the board with additional information or concerns. Remind the witness that a follow-up interview may be conducted. Interviewing aspects to avoid. Do not rush the witness while he she is describing the accident or answering questions. Do not judge, display anger, refute, threaten, intimidate, or blame the witness. Do not suggest answers. Do not make promises that cannot be kept, for example, unrestricted confidentiality. Do not use inflammatory words, violate, kill, lie, stupid, etc. Do not omit questions during the interview because you think you already know the answer. Do not ask questions that suggest an answer, such as, was the odor like rotten eggs? Incident Analysis Managing the analysis. The lead investigator is responsible for ensuring that events and causal factors analysis and other analysis methods are begun as soon as initial facts are available. This helps to identify information gaps early to drive the data collection process and identify questions for interviews. Accident investigation software is available and can sometimes be useful for identifying information gaps and for organizing causal factors. Note particularly in a major investigation an alternative and useful technique is to make use of a wall board with colored adhesive notes to set out elements of the events and casual factors. All team members can observe progress, provide input and plan changes. As the investigation and analysis proceeds the lead investigator needs to monitor and discuss progress to ensure that, if there are several members in the team, 
they are all working collectively to produce a quality result. If analysis and evidence gathering tasks are assigned to separate groups, the groups or individuals are interacting regularly to improve coordination, strengthen the analytical process and maintain focus. Analyses are iterative, that is repeated so that each version produces results that stage by stage approximates more closely to the end result. Several iterations may be needed as new information becomes available. Analyses address all organizational concerns, management systems and line management oversight functions that may have contributed to the accident causes. Causal factors, conclusions and judgments are supported by evidence. Significant facts and analyses do not result in a dead end, rather they are linked to casual factors. Careful and complete analysis of the data collected following an accident is critical to the accurate determination of an accident's causal factors. The results of comprehensive analyses provide the basis for corrective and preventive measures. The analysis portion of the accident investigation is not a single, distinct part of the investigation. Instead, it is the central part of the iterative process that includes collecting facts and determining causal factors. Well-chosen and carefully performed analytical methods are important for providing results that can aid investigators in developing an investigation report that has sound judgments of need. Caution must be taken in applying analytic methods. First, no single method will provide all the analyses required to completely determine the multiple causal factors of art accident. Several techniques that can complement and cross-validate one another shall be used to yield optimal results. Second, analytic techniques cannot be used mechanically and without thought. The best analytic tools can become cumbersome and ineffective if they are not applied to an accident's specific circumstances and adapted accordingly. Determining Facts Immediately following any serious accident, much of the available information may be conflicting and erroneous. The volume of data expands rapidly as witness statements are taken, emergency response actions are completed, evidence is collected and the accident scene is observed by more individuals. The principal challenge of the investigation team is to distinguish between accurate and erroneous information in order to focus on areas that will lead to identifying the accident's causal factors. This can be accomplished by understanding what activity was being performed at the time of the accident, personally conducting a walk through the accident scene, challenging facts that are inconsistent with other evidence, corroborating facts through interviews, testing slash inspecting pertinent components to determine failure modes and physical evidence, reviewing policies, procedures, and work records to determine the level of compliance or implementation. Tip, prevention is at the heart of the entire investigation process. Therefore, any accident investigation must focus on fact-finding not fault-finding. Fact-finding begins during the collection of evidence. All sources of evidence, for example, accident site walkthroughs, witness interviews, physical evidence, policy or procedure documentation, contain facts that, when linked, create a chronological depiction of the events leading to an accident. Facts are not hypotheses, opinions, analysis, or conjecture. However, not all facts can be determined with complete certainty, and such facts are referred to as assumptions. Assumptions should be reflected as such in the investigation report and in any close-up briefings. Team members should immediately begin developing a chronology of events as facts and evidence are collected. Facts should be reviewed on an ongoing basis to ensure relevance and accuracy. Facts and evidence later determined to be irrelevant should be removed from the accident chronology but retained in the official investigation file for future consideration. Contradictory facts can be resolved in closed team meetings, recognizing that the determination of significant facts is an iterative process that evolves as gaps in information are closed and questions resolved.
the team revisits the prescribed scope and depth of their investigation often during the fact-finding and analysis process. Doing so ensures that the investigation adheres to the parameters prescribed in the team's appointment memorandum. Causal factors of an accident are identified by analyzing the facts. Judgments of need, and the subsequent corrective actions, are based on the identified causes of the accident. Therefore, the facts are the foundation of all other parts of the investigative process. Using the core analytical techniques. Tip, the purpose of any analytic technique in an accident investigation is to answer TBE question. How did it happen? It is the job of the investigative team to apply whatever techniques can help them determine the causal factors of an accident. Accident investigation teams commonly use four techniques to analyze the factual information they have collected, to identify conditions and events that occurred before and immediately following an accident, and to determine an accident's causal factors. Following our descriptions of and instructions for using these four core analytic techniques, events and causal factors charting and analysis, barrier analysis, change analysis, root cause analysis, events and causal factors charting. Accidents rarely result from a single cause. Events and causal factors charting and analysis is useful in identifying the multiple causes and graphically depicting the triggering conditions and events necessary and sufficient for an accident to occur. For purposes of this manual events and causal factors charting and events and causal factors analysis are considered one technique. They are addressed separately because they are conducted at different stages of the investigation. Events and causal factors charting is a graphical display of the accident's chronology and is used primarily for compiling and organizing evidence to portray the sequence of the accident's events. It is a continuous process performed throughout the investigation. Events and causal factors analysis is the application of analysis to determine causal factors by identifying significant events and conditions that led to the accident. As the results of other analytical techniques, for example, change analysis and barrier analysis, are completed, they are incorporated into the events and causal factors chart. After the chart is fully developed, the analysis is performed to identify causal factors. Events and causal factors charting is possibly the most widely used analytic technique because the events and causal factors chart is easy to develop and provides a clear depiction of the data. By carefully tracing the events and conditions that allowed the accident to occur, team members can pinpoint specific events and conditions that, if addressed through corrective actions, would prevent a recurrence. Tip. To identify causal factors, team members must have a clear understanding of the relationships among the events and the conditions that allowed the accident to occur. Events and causal factors charting provides a graphical representation of these relationships. The benefits of events and causal factors charting include Illustrating and validating the sequence of events leading to the accident and the conditions affecting these events showing the relationship of immediately relevant events and conditions to those that are associated but less apparent portraying the relationships of organizations and individuals involved in the accident, directing the progression of additional data collection and analysis by identifying information gaps, linking facts and causal factors to organizational issues and management systems, validating the results of other analytic techniques. Providing a structured method for collecting, organizing, and integrating collected evidence, conveying the possibility of multiple causes. Providing an ongoing method of organizing and presenting data to facilitate communication among the investigators. Clearly presenting information regarding the accident that can be used to guide report writing. Providing an effective visual aid that summarizes key information regarding the accident and its causes in the investigation report. Constructing the chart. Constructing the events and causal factors chart should begin immediately. 
However, the initial chart will be only a skeleton of the final product. Many facts and conditions will be discovered in a short amount of time, and therefore, the chart should be updated almost daily throughout the investigative data collection phase. Keeping the chart up to date helps ensure that the investigation proceeds smoothly, that gaps in information are identified, and that the investigators have a clear representation of accident chronology for use in evidence collection and witness interviewing. Investigators and analysts can construct an events and causal factors chart using either a manual or computerized method. Accident investigation teams often use both techniques during the course of the investigation, developing the initial chart manually and then transferring the resulting data into computer programs. The manual method employs removable adhesive notes to chronologically depict events and the conditions affecting these events. The chart is generally constructed on a large conference room wall or many sheets of poster paper. Accident events and conditions are recorded on removable adhesive notes and affixed sequentially to the wall in the team's conference room or command center. Because the exact chronology of the information is not yet known, using removable adhesive notes allows investigators to easily change the sequence of this information and to add information as it becomes available. Different colored notes or inks can be used to distinguish between events and conditions in this initial manual construction of the events and causal factors chart. If the information becomes too unwieldy to manipulate manually, the data can be entered into a computerized analysis program. Using specialized analytical software, investigators can produce an event and causal factors graphic, as well as other analytical trees or accident models. Whether using a manual or a computerized approach, the process begins by chronologically constructing, from left to right, the primary chain of events that led to an accident. Secondary and miscellaneous events are then added to the events and causal factors chart, inserted where appropriate in a line above the primary placed above or below these events. Causal factors relationship and event. Always ask why an unwanted condition was allowed to exist. Depending on the complexity of the accident, the charts may result in a very large complex sequence of events covering several walls in the command center. For the purpose of inclusion in the investigation report and close-out briefings, the chart is generally summarized. Note that, assumed conditions, may appear in the final chart. These are conditions the team presumed affected the accident sequence, but the effect could not be substantiated with evidence. Such presumptive conditions, however, should be clearly identified as assumptions and given appropriate weight in the final analysis. Barrier Analysis Barrier analysis, sometimes called barrier and control analysis or energy trace and barrier analysis is based on the premise that an energy flow is associated with all accidents. Barriers are developed and integrated into a system or work process to protect personnel and equipment from unwanted energy flows, See figure 7-5. For an accident to occur, there must be a hazard which comes into contact with a target, because barriers or controls were unused or failed. For the purposes of this technique, energy is defined as kinetic, biological, acoustic, chemical, electrical, mechanical, potential, electromagnetic, thermal, radiation, or any other energy source. A target is a person or object that an unwanted energy flow may damage, injure, or cause a fatality. Barriers are anything used to control, prevent, or impede energy flows. Investigators evaluate uh, the adequacy of existing barriers and controls to determine why they were not used or failed, and b. Whether barriers were installed, and if not, why not? Evaluation of these barriers and their failures facilitates identification of causal factors. The basic barrier analysis process. Define final loss event, the events that result in loss or damage, for example, injury sustained, equipment damaged. Identify barriers, 
both barriers that were in place and those that should have been in place. Note that more than one barrier may be associated with each unwanted event. Evaluate purpose of barrier. Describe the purpose of the barrier and its intended function in eliminating hazardous conditions. Evaluate barrier's performance. Describe how and why the barrier failed, and the consequences of the failure. Validate analysis. Ensure that results are consistent with or complementary to the results of other analytic techniques. When evaluating the effectiveness of barriers and controls, investigators should understand the function location, and features of each barrier. Sources of needed data for a barrier analysis include preliminary drawings of equipment, systems or facilities, hazard analysis results, maintenance procedures, operational procedures, site maps. The minimum data needed to perform a barrier and control analysis includes facts and evidence in chronological order, Identification of all relevant hazards. Identification of all relevant barriers and controls. Facts regarding the function of each barrier and control. A barrier's exact function and location should be considered after determining how energy sources and targets can come together and what is required to keep them separated. Obvious barriers are those placed directly on the hazard, for example, a guard on a grinding wheel, those placed between a hazard and the target, for example, a railing on a second-story platform, or those located on the target, for example, a welding helmet. Barriers such as those defining the exposure limits required to minimize harm to personnel are less obvious. Therefore, investigators must cross-validate the results of the barrier analysis with other core analytic techniques to ensure that all failed, unused, or uninstalled barriers are identified. Accurate and complete causal factors of the accident can then be determined. Failure. In conducting barrier analysis, it is often useful to employ results of supplementary techniques such as change analysis or root cause analysis. These supplementary techniques can be used to more systematically identify and examine possible contributing and root causes leading to each failure. Change analysis. Change is one of the most important factors in the cause of accidents. Change is anything that disturbs the balanced of a system operating as planned. Change is often the source of deviations in system operations. Change can be planned, anticipated, and desired, or it can be unintentional and unwanted. It is an integral and necessary part of daily business, for example, requirements change, procedures change, policies and directives change, the personnel performing certain tasks change, that is, personnel turnover. Change can improve efficiency, productivity, and safety, or can result in errors, loss of control, and accidents. Tip, change analysis is particularly useful in identifying obscure contributing causes of accidents that result from changes in a system. Change analysis examines planned or unplanned changes that cause undesired outcomes. In an accident investigation, this technique is used to examine an accident by analyzing the difference between what is expected or planned, that is, an accident-free situation, and the actual sequence of events. The person performing change analysis systematically identifies specific elements or differences that cause the outcome of a certain task to deviate from the anticipated outcome. For example, why would a system that operates correctly 99 times out of 100 fail to operate as expected one time? Considerations for completing the change analysis worksheet. What? What is the accident? What occurred to create the accident? What occurred prior to the accident? What occurred following the condition or accident? What operational activities were underway when the accident occurred? What maintenance activity was underway when the accident occurred? Was there a training activity underway when the accident occurred? What equipment was involved in the accident? What barriers should have been in place to prevent the accident? 
What barriers were in place but failed to stop the unwanted transfer of energy? When? When did the accident occur? What was the facility's status at the time of occurrence? What was the facility's status at the time the accident was identified? Did the time of day have an effect on the condition? Personnel availability? Did the accident involve shift work personnel? For how many continuous hours had any involved personnel been working? Where? Where did the accident occur? What were the physical conditions in the area? Where was the accident identified? Was location a factor in causing the accident? Who? Who were the personnel involved in the accident? Which personnel witnessed the accident? Which personnel reported the accident? Which personnel ameliorated the accident? What was the training slash qualifications of the personnel involved? Who was supervising this activity? How? Was the accident caused by an inappropriate action? Was procedure use a factor in the condition? If so, did the procedure have sufficient detail? Did the procedure have sufficient warnings and precautions? Did the procedure cover work tasks in proper sequence? Why did the system allow the conditions to exist? Why did this event happen? End of part 2. The next part of the lecture commences with root cause analysis.